panel is to provide you with inspiration. So we hope that uh, in hearing the career stories of the professionals uh, here, that'll help to inspire you along the way in your own career journey. Um, it's also uh, another purpose is to provide you with insight and advice uh, so that you can learn about what it's really like to work in these areas and, uh, and how to get your career started. And uh, it's also an opportunity to connect and network with professionals working in sports and wellness. So we have right over here Drew Miller, who's uh, a fitness and lifestyle specialist with Phenomenal, Phenomenal Fitness Bodies Incorporated. Um, and he is a York al alumnus um, and he graduated in 2004 with a BA in sociology. And we have Jody Rumack, who's a management consultant with Can Canadian fitness recruiters. Mira McGill alum? McGill, yeah. yeah. And we have Jillian Spenson, who's a sports marketing and corporate sponsorship and charity professional. And, um, and most recently, she was with Maple Leaf Sports and Entertainment. And we also have Jeff Carson, who's um, visiting from very close to home. Um, he's the Equipment Services Supervisor here at the York University Sports and Recreation. Um, and he is an alumnus uh, with, a, with a BSc in kinesiology. Could you please each introduce yourself briefly and tell us about um, your current role or most recent role and your key responsibilities within, within that organization? Sure. Um, so, uh, again, Drew, hi. Um, I started my own business, so Phenomenal Fitness Body is actually my own company that I started back in 2010. Um, I guess my journey uh, when I graduated from, from York with a sociology degree, I was already personal training, so I used to work at a Good Life, Good Life Fitness. Um, I actually started there in 2003. And I worked there for about six and a half years, and it was a good place for me to really establish, I guess, one, my passion for personal training, being in the industry, and really just kind of establish my style, get an idea of what my, my specialties were, who my niche market was, who I'd like to train with, and really just, just hone your skills, and hone your, hone your, your tool set. And, Along the way, I've taken a lot of certifications and different workshops. So, you know, you grow your experience and you, and you gain your knowledge uh, over the course of time. And I got to the point where I felt like it was time for me to start my own company, uh, which I did in 2010, and it's flourishing to this day. So, uh, my acting role in that company is, well, right now I'm a, a one-man band, so I'm the CEO, founder, president, <laughs> marketing, sales, admin, trainer, head trainer. Uh, pretty much do it all right now, um, but also looking to expand right now. So, um, that's the process that I'm in. But, yeah, I love it. So, it's great. Um, so, the Canadian Fitness Recruiters is actually my company, um, so I'm the owner of that one, just, just actually started a few months ago. And uh, our main goal is to bring personal trainers to studios or small clubs um, and really make great connections between the two so that people can get into a really successful relationship and be able to grow their business, so your own personal training business and also obviously the business of the club. Um, I also do some consulting in the business as well and and obviously the primary goal there is to is to recruit the right trainers and also to educate so we have an education piece as well um, where we offer different courses and are working with different companies to to bring the best to you guys after you've finished your your years in school so yeah. uh, I'm Jill hello thank you for having us um, I'm on the panel to speak to my 13 years with Maple Leaf Sports Entertainment uh, most recently was the manager of fundraising for the MLSC Foundation, which is the charity of the corporation. Um, so my job was to oversee the fundraising. We were a uh, $5 million charity and it encompassed 50-50 and uh, events with our teams and our players. Um, it, it encompassed Leafs, Raptors, Toronto FC and Marlies, along with Air Canada Centre, BMO, Rico, all of the entities of MLSC. Um, so basically kind of a, a funny niche market of sport charity, um, there's not many obviously, um, but it was a really, it's a position that looked at working with all of the business units of MLSC because you're always dealing with ticket holders and suite holders and corporate partners and that sort of thing. So it was a really integrated position that worked with every business unit in the company as well as the players, the uh, executive management team of the company, the front offices, so it was a really kind of diverse bag of, of uh, interesting opportunities to connect with people um, and then just raising a whack of money and, and giving it back to the community, so nothing wrong with that. <laughs> um, 
Like I said, I'm Jeff Carson. I work in uh, Spartan Rec as the Equipment Services Supervisor. So I oversee all the varsity athletics equipment from purchasing to fitting to what you see on game day for uniforms, all the apparel that you see the athletes wearing around campus. That all comes through my office. Uh, I also purchase for the academic peaking classes in kinesiology as well as recreation and day to day. I oversee all of it, but on weekends primarily, primarily um, football is the sport that I oversee. So. Thank you. Um, and I'd like to ask you each to briefly share an overview of your career story with us uh, by telling us a little bit about how you became interested in, in this field, um, where you started your career, and then how you got to where you are today, so including your educational background. Uh, I graduated in 2007 with a kinesiology degree. Uh, at that time, uh, I was looking to do some more education and applied to a Spartan program here at York. Um, got into that, and at the same time, equipment services at the time had a five-month position, so just something that I could do while I was doing classes part-time to finish the certification. Um, three months into that five-month contract, there was an opening um, with another position in equipment services, the equipment services attendant, which I applied for. Um, got that position, finished up my uh, sport admin degree, or certificate in 2009, uh, and for the past three years, I've been the Equipment Services Supervisor, so it's more just been, for myself, right place, right time. Um, I wasn't, at the time of the five-month contract, wasn't looking for something full-time, but it was an opportunity that I thought I should take, and it's just blossomed from there, so. Um, my story makes no sense in a linear <laughs> sense of the, the girl that ended up where she did. Um, I started in the dance program at York in the first year, uh, transferred to Kin's second year. Um, before my last semester, uh, got a job on a Disney cruise ship being a dancer, which again made no sense because I wasn't dancing. It was just, I went for the free class. It was just, it was bizarre. Um, so I took eight months and we were part of the um, opening cast of their second cruise ship. So I was able to travel the world, amazing. Um, came back, did my last term and graduated. Um, but it was that Disney customer service training that I had that got me into the Air Canada Center as a fan service representative. So that was pretty much one of those moments where, you know, I wasn't looking, you know, for Disney to connect with ACC, but Disney's kind of the holy grail of customer service. So the Air Canada Center, of course, was saying, you have that training, we want you here. So I uh, started out in fan service at Air Canada Center, part-time, game nights, concerts, moved into full-time, um, and then I moved to be the Raptor player liaison, so for three and a half years I dealt with the players and managed their entire off-court, you know, sponsorship, marketing, charitable affiliations, um, basically any appearance because they do have a CBA where they're mandated to do certain appearances, <coughs> um, and did that, and then I moved to the Leafs specifically in their charity, the Leafs Fund. And I did that for four years, um, and it was exclusively Maple Leafs, so events and fundraising and all of that around the team. Um, and then in 2010, the Leafs Fund and the Raptors Foundation came together to create the MLSE Foundation so that there was one charity encompassing all of the teams, which made complete sense. So then I was uh, promoted to manager of fundraising and then oversaw my team of uh, fundraising and it was split then into fundraising and giving as well. So from the start to that, it's, what did Drake say? Started from the bottom? No. <laughs> I threw that away. Everyone's awake. Okay. Um, but yeah, so it's just one of those things where, it, it, where I started from, just it's crazy where, you know, I never in a million thought 13 years at MLSE when I first started as a customer service rep at Gate 1 trying to direct people to their section. So it's, it's a pretty crazy path. <laughs> cool. Um, okay, so I actually started at McGill, in, and I took my degree in kinesiology there. Um, after that, my first position after school was actually in event planning, and uh, I did that for a few months, and, you know, probably month one and a half, I started saying, why am I doing this? I have a kinesiology degree, I love personal training, what am I doing in here? 
So I ended up, uh, while I was doing the event planning, I had gone to a few other gyms to figure out where I wanted to actually work out. And so I had sort of done the, the trail there and I ended up working out at Good Life. And so when I realized that I should be a personal trainer because I have a kindery, I uh, decided to go and apply there and I got the position as a personal trainer at Good Life. Um, and I worked there for two years as a personal trainer. Um, and then from there, there was, a, there was a time I actually had left the company and while I was gone, the manager had changed. And that was a position I was hoping to get. And so when I came back, um, it was taken. So I wanted to go and try to find a management position somewhere in the fitness industry. And I ended up working at uh, the Pavilion Fitness Club, which is up in Thornhill, if any of you guys are familiar with that one. Um, so I started there when it was nothing. It was bricks and electric wires everywhere. And I uh, was the manager of the Kids and Teens program. And that role grew just as the company got organized and, and grew itself. And I ended up doing what we call the service manager position. So that included everything from the Kids and Teens programs to adult paid group X classes to squash leagues, basketball leagues, um, customer service desks. So it was a sort of all-encompassing role there. And, uh, and then the next step was still again to grow and Good Life was really growing at the time. And so, or started I should say, growing at the time. Um, and so I contacted my old fitness manager from when I had been there originally, and she talked about the club opening team. So I ended up applying back to Good Life and got that position. So for three and a half years, I traveled across the country. I opened brand new Good Life fitness clubs. Um, I was in charge of the personal training team. So the recruiting, hiring, training, development of all the trainers and the fitness manager um, in that club, I was there anywhere from a month to three or four months, helping them get get organized and make sure they were 100% ready to be successful before I passed them on to the regional manager for the area. Um, simultaneously for about a year when I met Drew actually was um, I was also the fitness manager for my own location. So I was opening up clubs across the country, training the fitness manager, but I also was a fitness manager for a year there too. And uh, the last role was to become a regional manager. So I ended up my last role at Good Life was to have 13 clubs that were all mine all the time, Northern Ontario region, um, also a great step in my career, learned a ton. And uh, throughout all that, I really realized I had a passion for recruiting and for finding the right people and for really helping people like you guys find the right place to work. So, you know, is it the right fit personality-wise, what you're looking for for hours or pay and all that kind of stuff? and really making the right matches. And so that's why I decided to start my own, my own company there and, uh, and doing the consulting as well to help the clubs if they feel like that's something they need. And the education piece is the last piece there to help everyone, again, get the skills that you know, maybe didn't learn in school. So that's, that's my journey. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, um, as I mentioned, you know, I'm a York graduate. Um, so I, st my, I guess my journey started in 2003. Uh, Good Life opened in my area. I live in Markham. And really I applied because when you work there, you get a free membership to a gym. <laughs> so I said, why not? <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a gym jockey. I've worked out for years beforehand. I've played every sport known to man. So I've always been into athletics. And for me, it just seemed like the, the perfect fit. So I originally applied, and I applied as what's called the member ambassador, where, yeah, I know you're doing good on this one. So really, <laughs> Me too, it's okay. Yeah, really all you do is uh, you kind of give new people that come to the gym, you give them orientations, you take them on tours around the gym, um, you orient them on, on specific uh, equipment in the facility, and then kind of send them off. And that was boring, I hated it. I just, it's, it was mind-numbing doing it. And everybody that came to me thought that I was a personal trainer and wanted free training advice right away. I'm like, no, that's not me. So that lasted me about four or five months. The manager comes to me one day and says, okay, Drew, you're not a good member ambassador, so what would you like to do? <laughs> you can either put you into sales or you can try personal training. I said, let me go let me try personal training. I like working out, I like teaching people. So uh, at that time I got my, my Canfit Pro certification, Canadian Fitness Professionals, and started in the summer of 2003. Um, and pretty much that's where my journey started in terms of personal training. And at the time, I was also going to York. I was studying here. Um, I started here taking admin studies. 
through Atkinson. If anybody's in Atkinson, don't take what I say personally, but couldn't stand it. Uh, wasn't, uh, didn't feel it was the best program for me, and ended up bouncing around and finishing with a sociology degree. Uh, so, um, at the club I was at, got to become one of the most well-known trainers there. I was one of the busiest at the time. Um, I had to turn clients away. I had people watching me train my clients sometimes. These have a little audience going on. Um, around 2007, um, I started studying kettlebells, and I became a kettlebell instructor. Um, now I consider myself one of the best kettlebell trainers in Canada, and if you ever YouTube me, you'll see some of my videos. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I uh, became a kettlebell, uh, kettlebell master trainer, I uh, started teaching instructor courses, so even to this point I teach trainers and instructors on how to use kettlebells with their clients, um, and particularly in terms of program designs, how to get the best results with their clients in whatever phases that they're working in. Uh, so doing that, kind of splitting both sides, and then got to the point with Good Life that I just had enough. Um, the manager and I didn't see eye to eye, and even just the way they want you to run your business and the way I wanted to run my business, there was a clash. Um, they're very much about sales, I'm about the service to the individual. If the client is happy, they will buy, they will come back, they will tell their friends. They want you to do you know, year-long prescriptions and try and sell $10,000 in one stretch. Some of my clients can't afford $10,000 at one time, but they can pay $2,000 every couple of months. As long as my clients are happy and they're coming back. I'm good. So, you know, you kind of, you pull teeth, there's a war back and forth. I uh, decided to leave in 2006, uh, started working at a private studio, also in my area. And I, I like my experience there because the clientele base was late 40s to early 50s. So I dealt with a lot of older adults, a lot of people with special needs. Um, so that really taught me a lot about patience and, you know, really nurturing people, especially people who had either never exercised up until their middle ages, or people who had suffered strokes, heart attacks. Uh, I had cancer victims that I worked with. Um, I had one person who had multiple sclerosis, had 40% muscle function loss on his right side. So it really forces you want to continue to educate yourself on how to work with specific client needs and be able to nurture them and just be patient. Um, I see a lot of times with trainers uh, in, in the industry and even people that train the facility that I work at, and you know they want to be the trainer that has the new and exciting exercise that people have never seen before, but if your client can't do it, it does nothing for you, and it does nothing for your client. Um, so that really taught me a lot about just being patient, understanding, and giving the client what they need first, rather than trying to boost my profile as being an exciting and new trainer to work with. Uh, so I worked there for about a year and a half, close to two years, and then the Good Life location that I used to work at uh, called me because they had a new fitness manager. Uh, he knew who I was, and he wanted me back badly. Um, offered to pay me almost double what I was making before. So of course, I can't turn that down. So I ended up going back to Good Life and working there for another couple of years, but still nothing had changed. So. I, uh, I worked there as long as I could, and then uh, winter of 2009, I decided, okay, that's it. Um, it got to the point where it's either I have to start my own business, or I have to choose a whole different career, because I just didn't enjoy what I was doing. And I'm the kind of guy, if I don't enjoy what I'm doing, you're not going to get my best effort. Uh, so I decided I want to continue with, continue with personal training, um, you know, work, uh, talking with and speaking with a couple of colleagues of mine who had done the same thing, started their own companies, I decided, okay, you know what? I'm going to take the chance, I'm going to start fresh and, and start my own business. So February 9th of 2010, on my birthday, I started my own company. And it's been flourishing well, I just completed my third year and it's grown every year. Um, again, I absolutely love what I do. Um, I work with everything from one-on-one -on -one, uh, personal training clients, I do semi-private groups of three to four people, I run boot camps. Um, I do sports specific training, uh, I've worked with soccer teams, volleyball teams, hockey, football, uh, you name it. I can work with any athlete and I can get them to their, to their best potential and their best results. And that's what I'm continuing to do today. Um, at this point right now I'm even studying, doing my uh, strength and conditioning certification through NSCA. So there you go, yeah. <laughs> so finishing that and uh, that will really give, give me a good fit in the door to start working with semi-pro teams as, uh, as I gain contacts and that's uh, where I feel my business is going and that's where I want my passion to go. So yeah, it's fun. Thank you for sharing your stories. Um, I noticed a theme through it. I think Jillian, it was you that said um, that your career path wasn't linear. I don't mm -hmm. think anyone's no. has been. No, it's <coughs> no. Sometimes I have to try things out first and see if you like them and if you don't. And also there's an element of being in the right place at the right time. Too. Yes. Oh, yeah.
Uh, since you both worked at Good Life and you both spoke about how um, uh, the experience at Good Life, from what, what, from what I've been told from a lot of people, especially how they operate, it's said to focus on sales, but they're, uh, the people who have worked at Good Life and people who still work at their training is not necessarily at the par, especially the campus pro certification. How do you guys feel about that certification in general? I just want to hear your opinion on that. So I have, I, I have other things as well, but I wanted to hear from someone who's gone through that. Uh, I guess your opinion of good life and can grow. I'll let you go first. Okay. Um, I, I'm gonna go to the good life part first, actually. So I've actually just stopped being there before I started my own. And, and I actually feel differently about the way that they do their business. I don't feel like it's all about sales. I, I feel like they do have a really great focus on the customer and about, and about caring about them. And I think it's all in the way that you deliver the message, um, which way that's gonna go. So I think, so I think that part of it, um, I would definitely say they have great customer service and they have a great focus on the client. Um, and maybe it, it's been a few years since Drew's been there, so. Um, definitely been some changes so I think it's it is definitely a there's always going to be sales if you're a personal trainer at the end of the day you can't hide from it it's just what it is but um, I think the issue there is that people think about sales as asking someone for their money and what you really need to think about is developing a relationship with this person helping them the best way you know how so I think that's a bit of a differentiation there um, in terms of CanFit Pro again like Anybody can have whatever certification you have, whether it's ACE, whether it's CPTN, whether it's CanFit Pro, whether it's CSCS, which I have and Drew's going to have as well. Um, I think it's more about what you do with it afterwards than it is about the course itself. People think, well, I've done my degree or my diploma in Kin or in fitness education, health and education, whatever it is, and that that's it. And it's not it. You've got to keep doing education even after you're done school. School is just the beginning, and so is your cert. So I think it's more about what you do with it um, than the actual certification itself. Um, Some to what Joey said, um, that's probably the most important thing is continuing your education. Um, you know, knowledge is power. The more knowledge you have, the more the more opportunities you have, the more resources you have, the better you can service people. The other thing is it, it keeps you into what you're doing, right? It keeps your mind fresh. It keeps you motivated. Um, I think that's where sometimes trainers tend to fall off the wagon a little bit is they just they're not motivated enough and Whether it's something that they don't feel is a career opportunity for them um, Like when I worked at Good Life the turnover for trainers was very very high and a lot of times it was people Just didn't look at it as either a full-time job or as something as a career like a lot of trainers came and they had full-time jobs already So this was something they did part-time. They maybe came in for three four hours a day. They trained their clients and they left um, so it's a matter of how ambitious somebody is. Um, so if they are an employee at Good Life, is it something they feel that they are going to grow with within the company or if they're going to uh, grow themselves as much as they can so if they decide they want to go off on their own, they have the platform to, to do it. Um, but yeah, a lot of it is, is, is where you feel your direction is and how much you feel you're, 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 you can grow with, within the, that, that kind of business. You said uh, opening a new gym. Um, obviously, there's a business aspect to that. Um, when you're thinking about that, how did you manage the, the, the res find the right, right people, the right resources, the, basically the right information to let you know to how to get that whole business started? Uh, okay. So, let me just correct myself. I didn't open my own facility. Uh -huh. I started my own training company. Okay. Um, but to answer that question, I mean, doing your due diligence is, is very, very important. So, if you decide that you want to open your own facility, um, the demographic, where is it going to be, um, you know, what are, the, what are your costs going to be, right, what's the leasing going to be, what's going to cost to keep the lights on, you know, the hydro, all of that, um, know what your budget is, uh, you know, so based on your expenses, how much money do you have to bring in, how many clients do you have to service, can you handle all the clients, if not, you're going to need a team, you know, you're going to have to hire trainers to train with you, you may have to hire a salesperson that can help you uh, bring in, bring in leads and, and to close them. You may have to hire an admin person. So there's just a lot of steps that you're gonna, that you have to go through. So for me, the easiest thing was, okay, get my business going, get a brand going. Um, I have a facility that I train out of that I pay a rent fee for, and I've been able to grow my business and grow my clientele that way. My next step is to open my own facility. So as I'm going through my due diligence right now, and Joey's helping me out with that, um, it's making sure that you know all your I's are dotted, all your T's are crossed. Um, you know, just the biggest thing when you open a facility or any type of venture like that is, is you don't want any surprises. 
you know, if, if you know that something's going to cost this much, budget another $10,000 just in case. You know, have that slush fund or that rainy day fund where if something unexpected happens, you, you, can, you can deal with it. You know, because for any business owner, the last thing you want is for something to creep up behind your back. So just, you know, make sure that you're ready for it. Well, you have to make sure that you've got a buffer. Yeah. You know, so many people think the black and white, that's what it is. Oh, that's what you're telling me. It's like, you have to have contingency plans, contingency plans. Con like, mm -hmm. you have to have three steps back from where you want to be to make sure that, you know, you have a safety net of some sort, especially if you're going out on your own. Uh, Julian, you mentioned that um, the Disney experience is what uh, probably helped you for LLC, but mm -hmm. um, in terms of continuing education, I mentioned you finished with a kinesiology degree. Right. Um, but is there anything else that um, you'd recommend or you um, you studied after for um, positions in the charity foundation or events with the... In sports, tend, people tend to think they need to act differently when they're around athletes in sports and like they're Jerry Maguire, my guns are loaded, what's up? You know, like, you know, like, you, people know if you're real or if you're not. And so when I look at my path at MLSC, it was, I started out and I just volunteered and I just was that person and I was like connecting with people of different departments and how I got to the Raptors was, um, the a lady I had volunteered for Raptor events and so all of a sudden that person left and she's like oh yeah Jill volunteered at a couple of our events and I, I applied and I I had that face connection of like right she's volunteered for us before boom done and then when I was in the positions there was always a question of what does this position look like but also what is the training associated with it and I think that's something that, you know, we, we are so keen on saying, like, how much are you paying me? How much vacation? What are the benefits? Like, all of those things. But also, what is the training? Is a, what a lot of people don't take into consideration. So um, they um, supported me in going to uh, Boston College. There was a corporate citizenship course, um, part of the Association of Fundraising Professionals. So I think that's something really a lot of people, especially coming out of university, I was like, how much is the paycheck? How much vacation? I was just very simple about it. But it evolved as I got these positions because then you're building not only your network, which is crucial, but also exactly like Drew said, you can't, no one can take that away from you. So regardless of what position you're in, you can say, okay, I've been to the Association of Fundraising Professional Congress the past three years. I've networked with those people. I mean, there are things that don't show up on a budget line, and that's those sorts of things that you, you may have to push for, you may have to negotiate them, but they are crucial because a lot of people look at your resume or, or your LinkedIn profile and they go through and they're like, oh, Boston College, whoa, okay, whoa, okay. And when you're aligned strategically with where you want to be, it shows that extra level of commitment that you're not only in the industry, but you're also trying to get best practices and networking and building up your contacts. So that was kind of how I navigated that through every step is just what's this position and what are the training opportunities as well, which I would highly recommend. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I've got another question. Maybe we can start with Jeff and down this way. Um, looking back now, is there anything that you wish that you had known when you were getting started in your career uh, that would have helped you to get where you are today more quickly and easily? Uh, for me, I'm not sure if there was any one thing that would have sped up the process for me in a few years that I was there or become supervisor. Um, but the one thing that I always continue wanting to learn is, I think, the difficult conversations. Dealing with people on a day-to-day -day basis, Drew's talked to this about clients and stuff, but just, if things aren't going right, those difficult conversations are probably the hardest things to have. So, if you can read a book on it, if you can take a class that talks about uh, HR and stuff like that, I think that would be, from my experience, would be something that would be helpful. Which I learned, picked up in schools. So. And you mean difficult conversations with, with clients or with clients with, with uh, your boss mm -hmm. with other employees, colleagues, mm -hmm. anybody that you're working with, suppliers. Things aren't always shun, sunshine and roses. There are <laughs> days when things don't go right, and you have to have that conversation with somebody that you work closely with, and they might be a friend. Outside of work, but at work, you sometimes have to have that conversation and say, look, you're not 
doing what you need to do to help us be successful. And you gotta pick it up and stuff like that. And it's not easy, especially if you're friends with somebody or even if you don't know them, it's even harder because you don't know, you're worried what they'll think about you going forward. So you gotta just take it. It's all about how you present it and you don't wanna attack anybody, but just give the facts and try and be as helpful to that person to try and, maybe they're just having a bad week. Something at home happened and, but if you can help them have that conversation with them look, look, and say, look, notice you haven't been up to snuff lately. How can we make sure that you're on the right track instead of bringing the whole team down? So. Keeping your resume current. Um, one thing that um, is really what I, we always used to say to our interns is, you know, every day, every week, every month, write down what you're doing. Because you know what? When your position ends, you're going to forget all the stuff that you did. You know? And so that's something I really would have found beneficial um, when starting out because if you're ever in a position where you have to write your resume or you need to whip something together quickly, you're going to freeze up and forget of the incredible things that you accomplished in your, in your time at whatever it is. And so for our interns, it would be actually part of our discussions with them, our weekly meetings with them would be, okay, so, you know, what did you do this, what did you learn, what was the success, what do you need to work on, and so it also keeps you in line as well going, is, am I getting out of the position what I really wanted to? You know, it keeps you on track saying, okay, am I still here for the right reasons, am I finding it interesting, am I getting wins, am I learning, am I growing, so I would just really encourage anybody, um, regardless of whatever position it is, is what are those especially marketable and, and business skills that are transferable that you can kind of pull out from your resume when you, because you might apply for a job in two years and you're going to forget, oh, I had that position and what did I do and just the intricacies that would be really beneficial to have on your resume to be highlighted and could potentially help you in that next step. So that's definitely something I would recommend. Um, I think if I had one thing that I wish I had done more of, it would have been more goal setting from starting from, as well, you can start any time, but um, even at the very beginning of my career. So right now, that's a really big part of what I'm doing on a consistent basis, whether it's yearly, monthly, weekly for the day. Um, just always having those set goals and knowing where you need to be by the end of any of those time frames. Um, and I think the other big thing is to think big. So don't just think about the next thing that's coming. You guys can start thinking now. It doesn't mean it's going to be exactly that, but you can start thinking now about what you would want to be doing if you had your wish and you could click your heels three times and it would be done. So I think that's a really big one is, you know, you're only going to get to something really big if you think about something that's really big. So. Yeah, I think the one thing that I wish I would have done would have been more goal setting from a lot earlier on, for sure. Uh, for me, two things um, that I wish I'd started earlier. I started a little bit later in my career. First one is networking, and Jill touched upon this. Get out and meet people as much as you possibly can. Meet people within the industry you want to get into. Meet people who have nothing to do with the industry that you're, that you're, that you're into. The more people who know you, who know who you are, and know what you can do, there are people, those are people that you build good relationships with are gonna be willing to help you out. And when you go and you do network people, go with the intention that you wanna help them. So if, you know, if, if you know somebody specifically that you wanna to talk to, that you wanna meet, do your homework about them. Find out what they do, find out what their services, their skill sets are, and come to them with something to say, listen, I can help you out with this. And it's the, it's the law of uh, re re reciprocity that when you help somebody else out, they'll be willing to help you out. And the more people you have in your corner willing to help you out, the better chance you're going to succeed. And if you have that big vision, the easier it is going to be to get there. Okay? Second thing, thank you. So the second thing is, and it kind of relates to the first one, is get out of your comfort zone. Okay? Don't be afraid to do something that you're not used to doing. If something makes you nervous, that means there's a good chance that it's going to bring something successful to you. Okay? That will bring something very rewarding to you. Uh, I had a business coach a couple years ago, and he had me draw a big circle and a little circle, okay? And the little circle was your comfort zone. Outside that little circle is where all the cool shit happens. <laughs> okay? That's good. You get out of your comfort zone, and I promise you that good things will happen for you.
if you guys are interested in the human resources conversation type stuff, I would really recommend two books. They go together um, called Crucial Conversations is the first one and Crucial Confrontations is the second. If you guys are interested in that stuff, if you're thinking about getting into a management role, even if it's not right now, but it's down the road, um, maybe you guys are familiar with those two books, Crucial Conversations and Crucial Confrontations. You can find them at Indigo. Yeah. She, she made a great point about uh, writing down what you do. Um, and another, another aspect of that is if you do be, decide to become a business owner and you do decide to hire people, that becomes your policy and procedures. So when you record what you do, what your tasks are on a daily basis, that becomes your protocol for how you can train people to do what you do. And you can start duplicating yourself. That's another great thing. You're just full of tips today, wow. A general question for everyone. Um, say you had a, a good job, but in a completely unrelated field to what you do right now. Would you still find yourself wanting to, in some part-time way, side way, get involved in what you do right now, a volunteer position or a, a, a side job or, or something informal that involves what you do right now? For example, uh, uh, Mr. Carson, would you still want to be involved in sports and rec here at the York University if you didn't work at York? Or would you still personal train? Or, or mm -hmm. get involved with uh, the Raptors or charities or, or management or, or whatever? <laughs> That's the great thing about my job. Um, growing up, I was always involved in sports, so even if I was in an unrelated field to sport and rec, I think I would, in some way, if it wasn't with York University, some other maybe soccer organization, hockey organization, organization, I think I would give back and be involved with that if it wasn't from equipment, if it was from coaching, fundraising, something that helped out mm -hmm. local sports and stuff like that. So athletics has always been a part of my life. and. This job just gives me the opportunity to work in that field, but being in, if I worked at a bank, I think I'd still want to be involved in sports mm -hmm. and participate in some way. I always think if you're going to, you want to be, a, if you want to be in something, be around it. And so, um, you know, everyone, how can I work with the Raptors? It's like, okay, well, there's like, the amount of people that work with them are on my hand, you know, so that world is very small. But if you want to be around it, you can volunteer, you can be an ambassador, you can, you know, there's always a way to be around it or be around the people who are around it because that might be the connections that get you where you need to go. You know, I was not a sporty person. I didn't watch a stitch of hockey before I worked for MLSC, you know, and now on LinkedIn, Brian Burke's recommended me. Like, makes no sense, but it was our working relationship that got us there, right? So for me, it was, my whole path has always been about people. I want to work with good people. I want to help people. I want to have a, a work environment that is positive. And that's why I love the KIN program too, right? Because dancing, it was very individual, the dance program. Very individual, very, you know, dancing is a different world. Whereas KIN, everyone's like, wants to help each other. It's very community oriented. So I wanted to be around that vibe. It wasn't, you know, sport specific, but it was that vibe that I wanted to be around. And, and so that's kind of what's led me through to Disney. You want to drop, you know, everything you have and be surrounded by show tunes and jazz hands? <laughs> Go to Disney, okay? <laughs> but that was the great vibe. It was people that wanted to help each other and just were happy to be there. And so that's the thread I've seen throughout my career is it wasn't necessarily sport, but I knew the environment that was conducive to what I wanted out of life. So. So I was around it, you know? So I would say if, if you're not in a sport-related job and you want to be there, look at the opportunities around where you want to be and seek them out. Like Drew said, like look on LinkedIn and see, you know, who works for this company. You might not even have a position in your mind that you know you want. You're just like, I think it'd be really cool to work for the Argos. Look on the Argo page. Connect. People love to talk about ourselves. We're all <laughs> like this, whether you all want to admit it or not. Um, but if you reach out to people and say, listen, you're at the top of your game, you're in an, in an industry I'd love to be in, you know, would love to grab 10 minutes, I have a set amount of, you know, show that you've done your homework, and reach out to people, they will make time for you. They absolutely will make time for you. So I would say just be around whatever you want to be a part of, find a way. I have a quick question back before I answer. So it may not be specific to you, but in the scenario that you gave, is the position that you're in right now something you're passionate about as well? Or is it just that it's a great, you're making good money? 
kind of deal. Just a decent job. I thought the bank was a perfect example. You know, you okay. might think the bank's all right to work at. It's probably not going to make your blood boil in a bad way. Yeah. So Hang on to the chandeliers. Yeah, no. Yeah. No. yeah. Party, fire, right. And, you know. Gotcha. Right. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Um, I know in my transition when I was figuring out what my next step was, you know, I made sure that I became a boot camp instructor because I didn't want to lose out on being in fitness entirely um, when I was going through a transition. So that, I definitely think you do want to stay with one foot in. But um, if the job that you're doing that's a quote-unquote decent job uh, isn't what you're passionate about, my recommendation would be to get out. Because, I'm not, I'm serious, because 10 years from now, it's going to be a lot harder for you to get out and get back into what you love. So if you want to be really successful, you've got to do something you're passionate about. Because I don't think, from the sounds of it, any of us wake up and go to work and go, ugh, I don't want to go to work. I know I don't. Only so, a 7 a.m. client. <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, I just... If, you've, if you're just out of school, a couple years out of school, whatever you're doing right now may seem decent. To me, long term, I don't know if that's going to be the right direction anyways because decent's not going to cut it in five, ten years from now. You're going to want to be in something that you love. And if you're trying to transition 10, 15 years from where you are now, it's going to be a lot harder. So I would do your due diligence, figure out how you can make some extra cash doing whatever, but get into the field that you love and do it now. And just like Jody said, if, if you feel like you have a, a passion for something, whether you think is going to make you a lot of money or not, you have to follow your passion. Because if you don't, you'll look back in 10 years and you'll regret everything. And it's been, like she said, it's much harder to start something 10 years from now than to start it right now. It may take a while, it will take a lot of homework, it'll take a lot of, a lot of patience and a lot of sacrifice, but the ultimate goal is well worth the effort. It's well worth putting the effort and the work in. And then when you're an old lady like I am, when I look at this panel, ridiculous, you have a husband <laughs> and children, that. right? Like so, And it's harder to make that move because you're just like, oh my god, now there's collateral damage if I screw this up, right? So it's kind of like, take yeah. advantage when it's just you to kind of say, listen, am I in? And the fact that you're questioning it says tons. Yeah. Go home, talk to your parents, talk to your girlfriend, right. figure it out. The reason, the reason I ask is because like, I get the feeling I'm probably the only person in the room doing politics, communications, graduate studies right now. Because, oh God, where are you going to use that? You know, what, where is the sports <laughs> so wellness joking. connection, right? <laughs> don't quote, this is a So it's not like I don't like what I'm doing, I do, but sometimes I sit in class and I say, like, holy crap, this is a really boring subject. I wish yeah. I was uh, lifting or learning a, a, a hands-on skill or something, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, I, I do firmly believe specialization is for insects. You shouldn't just do one thing your whole life, right? <laughs> so, so it'd be nice to be well-rounded and maybe like pursue like a side thing, whether I really like want to do massage therapy or something like that. So, you know, it doesn't have to be your, your full lifetime calling, but get involved, be around with people. Yeah. yeah. That's true. Okay. Okay. Well, kind of going on that question, um, most of you sound like you have... Um, your BSc in uh, kinesiology or even in sociology, but um, for other people who are like involved in sports, um, in the sports world and not necessarily from uh, an educational background that would um, involve something like that, like I'm in the fine arts, so I, mm -hmm. I graduated in theater, but I had um, experience in, you know, um, managing sports, but do you think the stress now for people hiring is on the education itself, or is experience valuable or do you find that um, there's there is a big um, like they're really seeking people with that education if not in your undergrad in mm -hmm. your certification program and anyone mm -hmm. has any insight on that i think my world's different than your world than your world so <laughs> we can all talk to our world go ahead um, we just hired some new staff in the past year and it's so much we weren't looking for people that had kinesiology i happen to have it I happen to have a sport admin, which I believe helped me, but um, more looking for people that are willing to learn, looking at their experiences, where they volunteered, um, not just so much their education. It's nice to see that you have a degree. They, most places look to see that you have some sort of post-secondary education. Um, 
but for us when we were looking, it was more people when we were interviewing, we were looking for people that we thought would be a good fit, had some experience, were willing to learn, and just people that were passionate about sports, just because you're taking politics and stuff, doesn't mean you're not passionate about sports. There's parts within government that deal with sports, and I've listened to a couple of those people talk over the past couple of years, <laughs> and um, they don't sound like politicians, they sound like people that are interested in sports. So I don't think being specialized in kinesiology necessarily gives you a leg up in sports, unless you're doing something maybe more what Drew does that might help you a little bit more from the anatomy standpoint. But in terms of what I do in equipment services, um, has it helped me? Yes, but do I think it's a necessity? I don't think so. But I think more of the passion and the willing to learn about mm -hmm. whatever whatever job you're willing to do, if it's in sports or anything else. So long as you're willing to learn about the job and passionate about it, I think that's the biggest key. And as long as you try and convey that when you have an interview or an opportunity to talk to somebody about a volunteer experience or whatever it is, just take those opportunities that are out there. And I think to extend on that one is being able to speak to your resume because you might not have the, you know, if you want to do a, a certificate program, that's great. But if you have your degree, but your experience or your volunteering or your, you know, education, uh, sorry, your certificates or whatever else you want to, or associations you're a part of, is being able to speak to it in a cover letter and an interview and say, listen, I got this because I was passionate about theater and da 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 da. Um, but going through the process, I decided that, you know, what was really my passion is sports and that's why I got involved with A, B, C, D, and E. So to me, it's not necessarily the, you have to have this linear thing. It's being able to speak to it and to, because for us, like we would always in the conversation say, why do you want to work here or, you know, what drives you? And when you can articulate that and say, you know what, I was here and now I'm so drawn to this that I need to be around it in whatever way possible. And that's why I volunteered at Right to Play and, or whatever it is, that takes you farther than anything. And it's just being able to communicate your passion and your vision and, and why you need to be involved. You know, I think attitude is so much, so underrated when it comes to hiring, you know, because really you want someone who wants to be there and you want someone who's passionate about the project or the vision of what you're hiring them for. So do your homework, you know, know what the company is about, know what the position's about and what you can bring to the table. And you might not have, you know, what would a theater major want with this? You need to be able to bridge that gap in that interview and be able to say, I know you might think, or this, or, or I know I'm from here, but this is what I can bring to the table, and just spell it out, spell it out. And it's in the interview, because sometimes even um, the first challenge is getting it to stand out on paper, mm -hmm. and to get that interview, because, you know, depending where you put your education, I guess, on the resume, it's, oh, theater, okay, interesting, and then mm -hmm. it's about, I guess, like you said, um, just somehow making it stand out that that's the reason that's yeah. the, transition into the new passion. Exactly. Yeah. I think, uh, yeah, I'm going to agree with both you guys. I I definitely think it's the personality and the person, what they're looking for and the passion that I would go for first. Um, and, you know, definitely for those of you guys who have a kin degree, that will help you in terms of where you would start in the PT world. So it doesn't necessarily mean you'd get the position over somebody else, but you may start at a different pay level, right? Because you have more experience, you have more certification behind you. So, um, but, I, but I don't think that if you don't have the kindred, I don't think that that would um, automatically take you out of the running by any means. Um, I agree, if you have a really great, great attitude, great passion, can speak to your resume, all that stuff. And I think just to add to your comment um, about getting the interview in the first place, that's where your networking is gonna come in. That's where you're gonna go to somebody and say, Okay, I'm volunteering for so and so. And when you guys know what you want to do, just tell everybody. Doesn't matter who they are, tell everybody. Anyone you meet, oh yeah, what are you doing? Looking for a job, what do you want to do? Whatever. And then you never know who's going to say, actually, I have a friend who does X, Y, and Z. And even if that person isn't going to be the one who you want to work for, maybe they're in the industry and they have a better connection too. So that's where for somebody like you, if, that's, if you find that that's stopping you from getting interviews in the first place, mm -hmm. I would say definitely use your network and just start telling everyone you see what you want to do. Okay. Thank you. Okay. If 
Oh, this is left for me? Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I agree with what everybody said. You know, my position, I don't have a kin degree, right? I'm a sociology major. People might look at me and think sociology, but I have to do with personal training. <laughs> um, so I guess my thing to that is that, you know what? Education knowledge comes from everywhere. It's not just in a book. Right? It comes from, yes, what you read, but also comes from what you experience, the people that you interact with, things that you see, anything that you internalize and, and, and you take in, you know, you can use it to your advantage. Um, obviously, education does help and, you know, it is a, a societal standard that having a degree does put you in a, a more recognizable class or, or might put you in a, in, a, in a better position where it really just means that, you know, the door might be open for you a little bit more, whereas if you don't have a degree, you might have to kick in that door. You know, you might have to be more aggressive, more persistent, more dedicated to get what you want. And it's like what everybody talks about here, right? It, it's getting yourself out there. It's, it's making your presence known. You know, get people to know who you are by your passion, by your, the way you speak to people, the way you interact, um, the way you're willing to take risks and take chances. People look at that and, and they recognize that and they appreciate it as well. Um, you know, it, you, you give off a vibe to somebody that they're going to want to be around you. They're going to want to connect with you. And that a lot of times is what can give you, give you those opportunities. Whereas sometimes just having a degree, yeah, you know what, you might be book smart, but you're not be able to talk to anybody. You know, I, I've met a lot of trainers who had the book smarts, but you ask them to explain a squat to somebody and they can't do it. Nor, they can, nor, nor can they correct somebody. So, you know, I mean, it does based on the individual, but, you know, if you feel that your passion, your strength is in how you interact with people, then that's what you utilize. You know, obviously educate yourself along the way, continue to learn and grow, but go with what your strengths are. So the education is, is a part of it, but it's not the whole picture. It's, 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 it's a part of it. You, you know, don't think that it's not significant. It is, but that's not the end all and be all. Okay. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, Jill mentioned this several times. Um, could you expand on the importance of volunteering or mm -hmm. internship mm -hmm. and how that could create a more likelihood of finding a successful place for your career path? Mm -hmm. I think it it's not only helps your career path of what you want to do, but also what you don't want to do. Mm -hmm. Because I think um, when I was in your spot and I was just about to graduate, I thought, I'm, you know, I had so many grand ideas. And then when I started to kind of piece it all together, some of them didn't, you know, pass the test and just said, you know, I don't really want to be in this environment and I don't want to, this is not for me and I don't, you know. So it's a great, volunteering is a great opportunity to build your resume, but also build your path in terms of, okay, this just reinforced, this is where I want to be. Now, we live in a day and age of immediacy and everything is now and, you know, right now, all of us in our minds are on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, blah, 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 right? Like it's, we haven't done a selfie. There's something wrong here, like in an hour. Like it's ridiculous, right? I was going to plug, but I was like, got, it might be a bad idea. What's your website? <laughs> yeah. You already did a YouTube plug, come on. Um, no, but it's, it's one of those things where it's all about now. And we need to take a step back and realize that a career is, is many, I heard, you know, Liz, you could speak to this, is that graduates now are faced with maybe five different career fields, not even jobs, you know, and, and diversity is the key. So be open to everything, you know. I didn't expect to be where I was, you know, with the Raptors traveling with the team, hosting, you know, I, never in a million. But what I did was, like Drew said, it's volunteering, it's being around it, it's, it's just giving of your service, just saying, listen, I have a free afternoon, can I sell 50-50 tickets at a game? Guess what, you're gonna go to that game, you're gonna meet the charity, you're gonna meet people from Right to Play, Special Olympics, kids sport, okay, talk to them a little bit. Guess what, you're already there, this is not costing you a coffee, great, boom, there. You get a slice of pizza, you get to watch half the game, life is good. Seeking out those opportunities, Pan Am is coming massive opportunities to see is this something you're passionate about and even on the level of you know at york or or in your community you know go to your community center be a be a get a part-time job as a teacher there is teaching something you're passionate about T do things that you don't think are going to like oh i want to be here what does this have to do with this you have no idea how this is going to connect with this mm -hmm. Me living in a shipyard in Venice, Italy on a, on a Disney cruise ship as it's being built has nothing to do with being at Vince Carter's engagement party. 
You know what I mean? Like it just, it doesn't make sense. But what the theme is, is that I was open to all the experiences. You know, it's, it's what all of us have talked about. Be open to everything. Um, a to B rarely happens nowadays. It's about, you know, getting a job through the person, the person, the person, the person, the person, their friends, barbers, dog walker. Mm -hmm. That's how you're gonna get your job. Mm -hmm. So it's just really being open to everything and around it and volunteering and because people, exactly like Drew said, it is your face, it is your brand. Like, I wanna do 10 push-ups right now. Like, cause Drew's like fired <laughs> me up, like, right? Like, it's just like, I just wanna, <laughs> But it's, it's that passion, and when you realize and you're around things, you're like, okay, I, I, I like this environment, and then it helps you kind of differentiate what your path is. And, and that way, when a position, a paid position comes up, you won't be in the position going, oh, it's a good job. I'm going to fall asleep at 2 p.m., but it's a good, decent job. <laughs> you're going to try to avoid those moments, which we all have. You're going to go through them but it'll help shape where your true passion is and, and, and then you'll have a network of people that will help you navigate that, which is the best thing. Yeah, sorry, just, just to add to that, it, it's, it's the spirit of giving, you know, and I mentioned it before, when you look to help other people, when you look to help organizations, charities, you come with a gen like nobody's gonna volunteer and be like, oh, I gotta go volunteer, <laughs> damn it. Voluntold. Right. Yeah, voluntold, <laughs> right. You, you volunteer because of something that you're willing to do. You're, you're offering up your time, you're offering up your, your, your experiences, your knowledge, just yourself. And when you do that, and the people that you're going to meet, you're going to come from a place of genuineness. And, and the fact that you're willing to reach out and help out other people in whatever capacity, people are going to connect with them, they're going to respond to that. That takes care of part of your networking right there, is being able to meet new people. Right? Networking isn't about, oh, I gotta make contacts so I can make money. Networking is, let's just, like Joey like said before, build relationships. Just get to know people. The more people that you know, and you get to tell them about who you are, share your story, share what your passion is, what you wanna do, now you have people who are gonna represent you when you're not around. Yeah. Because they're gonna talk to you like, oh, you know what, I'm, what's your name? Johnson. Johnson. People, you know, you could go to a, a charity event and talk to somebody like, you know, I met Johnson. Man, he's a, he's a great guy. You need to call this guy. You know, he's going to help you out. He, he can, you know, really you know, help you in, in, in this capacity. And that could be a CEO of a company who might have a position that is going to open up. And they're going to hear about, you know, the kind of passionate person that you are, the considerate person that you are. And you never know what opportunity is going to come of it. So, you know, volunteering is, again, it helps you to network. It helps you to get your face out there. But by coming off with, in a genuine sense that you're willing to give yourself to people and give your time uh, to other people, people are going to reciprocate that. They are going to do whatever they can to help you. And, and it makes your path a lot easier. Yeah, you know, that was one thing I wish I did earlier. I felt like I had to do everything on my own. I had to go out and, and you know, find clients on my own and do this, this, and that. When I realized, you know what, if I join a networking group or if I go out to this organization and say, hey, you know what, um, can I volunteer my time here? Um, I went to a high school football combine downtown. I said, you know what, can I come and help out for a couple of hours, run the kids through some drills, take them through some skill sets, and before you know it, I had two teams ready to work with me. You know, so you never know where the opportunity is going to come from, but if you get yourself out there, get out of your comfort zone and be willing to do that, that, that will help to accelerate your process rather than feeling you have to take one step at a time on your own. Can I just quickly add to that too, is when it comes to networking, and it's been a buzzword because it's gospel, is keep your network fresh and engaged all the time. Yeah. Don't just go to your network when you need something. Yeah. You know, I think that's the most crucial thing because it's kind of like, oh, I haven't heard from you for 10 years. Oh, and all of a sudden I need a favor. Like it just, it doesn't, it's bad business and it doesn't work with what you want to be known as. So keep it fresh. Um, there is always time for coffees and lunches, whether you think there is or not. You know, it's worth the Saturday, whatever, or the night that you have to go because that's the only time that person is available. Um, it is so crucial to keep that fresh and engaged and heaven forbid, pick up the phone. Like, it's crazy. <laughs> Phones are for more than, like, it works, it rings. Remember this thing? Amazing. <laughs> so, because it's, it's such a lost art form now, is to pick up the phone and talk to somebody, and really is the quickest way to make a connection. Like, everyone's emailing, but guess what? That person also has 800 emails to go through. You know, you want to make an impression, leave a voicemail, you know, pick up the phone, and keep it fresh with your network when you don't want something. 
Yep. Because then when you do need something or you need a, a connection or a favor or something, they are more than happy to. And always look on how you can connect people. If someone sees you as, as a facilitator, as someone who brings people together and connects people, gold.